on and do a little reading real quick. I want to hop on do this reading right quick. It's on eight. It's uh, William S. Plumer. William S. Plumer, Banner Truth Commentary. Um, it's a good one. I'm just going to read some of the notes on Psalm 108. Um, we will be, hey, oh, there we go. There we go. Uh, that's right. My cousin Marie is on. <laughs> Hey, Victoria. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to hop on and do a little reading on some notes from this commentary on Psalm 108. Sherry McNeil, uh, good morning to you. And uh, just wanted to do hop on, do a little reading and discussion on Psalm 108. Okay. Um, there it is. I believe that's it. Let's see. But yeah, I uh, just wanted, where am I at? I am confused. I should have found it before I hopped on live. It's funny. There we go. There we go. There's 106. It's the Roman numeral letter, so you got to be careful. <laughs> there you go, 107. 107 is a good one. All right, that's right, 108. All right, so it says, uh, we'll say, Dear Lord, I uh, thank you for this uh, day. I think we could do a little reading in Psalm 108. Pray that you would help us along and pick up a couple things. Pray in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, psalm 108 says, A song or a psalm of David. Uh, it's 13 verses, 13 verses. It says, Oh God, uh, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise even with my glory. Awake, uh, psaltery and harp. I myself will awake early. Uh, verse 3, I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people, and I will sing praises unto thee among the nations. For thy mercy is great above the heavens, and thy truth reacheth unto the clouds. Uh, be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens, and thy glory above all the earth, uh, that they, that thy beloved may be delivered. Uh, save with thy right hand and answer me. God has spoken in his holiness. I will rejoice. I will divide Shechem and meet out the valley of Sukkoth. Verse 8, Gilead is mine, Manasseh is mine, Ephraim also is the strength of mine head. Judah is my lawgiver. It says, verse 9, Moab is my washpot. Over Edom I will cast out my shoe. Over Philistia will I triumph. Who will bring me into the strong city? Who will lead me into Edom? Uh, wilt not thou, O God, who hast cast us off? And will, wilt not thou, O God, go forth with our hosts? Verse 12 says, give us help from trouble, uh, for vain is the help of man. Through God we shall do valiantly, uh, for he is, for he it is that shall tread down our enemies. Amen and amen. All right. It says on the title, see on, on the title, see on title Psalm 3 and also 30 looks like all right we got three and we got 30. it says david certainly wrote this psalm uh the first five verses are taken from psalm all right what is l v i i l v i i anybody good with roman numerals let's see is l 50 maybe it's 57 that's my guess 57 um uh, the first five verses are taken from Psalm 57, the last eight. All right, and then oh, the last eight from Psalm LX. LX, that would be 60, right? 
Okay. So we'll go over there. 57 and 60. Thank you, Faye. And good afternoon or morning to you. Good morning to you. Uh, it says, um, in the in this, the variations. I almost lost my pencil. You see that? That was wild, wasn't it? All right. It says the variations from the originals are slight and have perhaps been sufficiently noticed. The chief difference between this psalm and the two from which it is taken is that this omits their sad and despondent parts and contains such selections from them as express gratitude, hope, and confidence. They go, hey, Jessica Remsen, good morning to you. Good late morning to you. All right, Martin Luther is persuaded that portions of this psalm refer to the setting up of the kingdom of Christ in all nations. So that's cool. Thank you for Martin Luther uh, throwing his two cents in there, saying that uh, Luther is persuaded that portions of the psalm refer to the setting up of the kingdom of Christ in all nations. We like that. Um, David's throne has um, uh, perpetuity in no other way. The example of David in making one psalm out of two suggests the propriety of our combining different portions of God's word for our own use and edification according to the circumstances in which we may be placed. What he's saying is there is like, look, it's good to know the all of scripture, know all the different parts of scripture. So you can put different scriptures together to help you figure out your situation. You know, whatever your circumstance, how you should respond or how you should uh, reply. You can look at all different passages of scripture and put many scriptures together. So that's good. Uh, such an exercise would make us familiar with scripture. Yes, it would. And uh, and show us the variety of excellent uses to which it may be applied. I agree 100 percent. That's why it's good to know, you know, as much scripture as possible. So when you think of certain things, you say, well, you know, that reminds me of Second Peter. That reminds me of Exodus 7. Uh, this reminds me of the Psalm, chapter 37, boom, boom, boom. You can put together passages to say, you know what, this is why I believe this, or this is why I choose to respond this way. All right? Very good. I'm going to flip over to Psalm 57 and 60. At least I'm going to try to, and we'll see what it says. So we got an L. Let's see, L, V, I. Okay. There it is. L, V, I. All right. All right, Psalm 57. I should put a little uh, three. There's my three by five cards. Yeah. Isn't it great when you got three by five cards? Oh, yeah. So we'll put one as a bookmark right there. Boom. Psalm 57. Uh, be merciful unto me, O God. Be merciful unto me, for my soul trusteth in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings I will make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. Uh, I will cry unto God most high, unto God that performeth all things for me. He shall send uh, from heaven and save me from the reproach of him that would swallow me up. Uh, God shall send forth his mercy and his truth. Verse 4, my soul is among lions, and I lie even among them that are set on fire, even the sons of men, uh, whose teeth are spears and arrows, and their tongue a sharp sword. Uh, verse 5, be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. They have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is uh, bowed down. They have digged a pit before me uh, in the midst whereof they are fallen themselves. Uh, here we go. Verse 7, my heart is fixed, O God, my heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. Awake up, my glory. Awake, sultry and harm. I myself will awake early. I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing unto thee among the nations, for thy mercy is great unto the heavens, and thy truth unto the clouds. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. Amen. So that's nice. Psalm 57. We'll put a little 10, 13, 21 right there. Well, that's interesting. Uh, okay. 
And I see that. And the other one, uh, Psalm 60. I'm going to do another. Where my three by fives go? There they go. All right. Psalm 60. Eight, fifty-nine, that's sixty right there. All right, Psalm sixty reads. I don't forget to put the seventy in. Fifty-seven. There you go. There you go. All right, Psalm sixty. Oh God, Thou hast cast us off; Thou hast scattered us; Thou hast been displeased. Oh, turn Thyself to us again. Thou hast made the earth to tremble. Thou hast bro uh, broken it. Heal the breaches thereof, for it shaketh. Thou hast showed thy people hard things. Thou hast made us to drink the wine of astonishment. Thou hast given a banner to them that fear thee, uh, that it may be displayed uh, because of the truth. Verse 5, that thy beloved may be delivered, save with thy right hand, and hear me. Verse 6, God hath spoken... In his holiness, I will rejoice. All right, here we go. I will divide Shechem and meet out the valley of Succoth. Gilead is mine. Manasseh is mine. Ephraim also is the strength of mine head. Judah is my lawgiver. Moab is my washpot. Over Edom, I will cast out my shoe. Philistia, triumph thou because of me. Uh, who will bring me into the strong city? Who will lead me into Edom? Will not thou, O God, which has cut, cast us off, and thou, O God, which didst not go with our armies. Give us help for the, for trouble, for vain is the help of man. Uh, verse 12, through God we shall do valiantly, for he for He it is that shall tread down our enemies. Amen. So that's exciting, very exciting. Psalm 60. So Psalm 57, I'm going to write that down. So Psalm 108 is basically Psalm 57 and 60 put together. Okay. So it's actually 60 verse 6 basically to 11. And then Psalm 57 will look. All right. Um, all right. Let me read some of the notes on 60, verse 6 to 11. Psalm 108. Oh, there we go. I've done this one before. Yes, I have. All right, here's some notes on Psalm 60. Okay, you guys ready? It says, uh, sin is dreadful. It has filled hearts and houses and nations and our world with woe. Uh, Mr. Scott says, quote, the anger of God against sin is the sole cause of all misery, uh, personal or public, in families, churches, and nations, which has been is or shall be endured in time or to eternity. That's that is good. Um, there we go. So that's a good one. Um, let me see if I got some of my markers in my pulpit. I usually stay pretty packed, got a blue. Let's go with blue. Pencil behind the ear. All right, you ready? Sin is dreadful. It has filled hearts and houses and nations and our world with woe. Okay, Mr. Scott says, the anger of God against sin is the sole cause of all misery, personal or public, in families, churches, and nations, which has been, is, or shall be endured in time or to eternity. So that's a good uh, explanation. And also basically just saying like death alone, like that, like originally death came into the world because of Adam's sin, right? Adam and Eve sinned. Um, 
and death reigned. You know, that's when death came in, uh, enter the scene. So ultimately, sin is the mass culprit. Okay. Uh, number two says, among the worst temporal consequences of sinning against God are dreadful public calamities, loss of public confidence, misrule in many forms, anarchy, confusion, wars, famines, pestilences, men's hearts failing them for fear, injury, oppression, and violence. Goodness, that is pretty on point. So this is written in the 1800s. So let me read. This is on uh, Psalm 60 right now. It says, Among the worst temporal consequences of sin against God are dreadful public calamities, loss of public confidence, misrule in many forms, anarchy, confusion, wars, famines, pestilences, men's heart failing them for fear, injury, oppression, and violence. So that's... Um, I had read that before and I wrote DAG next to it, D-A-G. That just means that's pretty hardcore, pretty hardcore. All right. So um, speaking of wars, sounds like Taiwan, you know, Taiwan's trying to be independent. They're they're part of People's Republic of China, uh, but they're kind of like their own country, but not really. So there's a lot of beef going on. So you can pray for the people of Taiwan. Taiwan is an island uh, north of Japan. Uh, maybe northeast of Japan, I believe, and then uh, east of China, southeast of mainland China. And it is an island that has 26 million people, 26 million. So, dear Lord, we lift up Taiwan, pray for all the salvation of everybody there, a whole lot of Buddhist folks, a whole lot of uh, different religions, but we just pray, God, for your revival to break out and pray for peace. Uh, in Jesus' name, amen. Verse uh, Number three, uh, the third doctrinal and uh, practical remark on Psalm 60. It says, uh, it is much to the credit of any man after long and fearful contest, wrongfully waged against him or his cause, wholly to forgive and forget all personal injury and mourn over public calamities and pray and labor for the public good. Uh, quote, it is the glory of man to pass over a transgression. I usually like writing these out. I don't want to waste your time by me writing. Um, yeah. Uh, verse four, it is well uh, when our distresses, uh, personal or national, lead us to a throne of grace and make prayer for our frequent business. Prayer meeting. So there you go. Verse four is well when our distress, right, personal or national, uh, lead us to the throne of grace and make prayer our frequent business. Amen. So, you know, with the world being all crazy right now, it should drive us into deeper prayer. Hey, Sandy Wilson O'Shea, good to have you on. That's right. Just doing a little reading, uh, some study notes, some commentary by uh, William S. Plumer from the 1800s. He is a Presbyterian bro, but I do like a lot of stuff he says. Verse five, uh, let good men commit their country to God. Ain't that the truth? What is this? All right, you ready for this? Watch this. Let good men commit their country to God. David's country was perhaps reduced to a lower point of depression than it is easy for us to conceive, and he carried the case to God. Let us do the same. There is hope of peace when we look to God for peace. Amen to that. Into that. Number six, if God should send on each man and nation the judgments which they deserve, each one would soon be drinking the wine of astonishment. Verse three. I'm going to agree with him. I'm going to go ahead and agree with Brother William here. If God basically should send on each man and nation the judgment which they deserve, if he really treat us as our sins deserve, everyone would soon be drinking the wine of astonishment be ast astounded oh that sounds like the trash truck out there that's not bad so not bad you know usually they've been coming a day or two or three late so uh they can't pick up the trash today amen all right good uh so there you go astonishment that's verse three right astonishment all right seven uh if 
We see hard things. Let us remember that our sins call for them, uh, that they are perhaps necessary for our growth in grace, and that good men such as David saw the same. Verse 3, uh, verse 3. David's greater son, I think talking about Jesus, saw still harder things than any of his people. That's right. I have a little study I wrote on the side. We all deserve worse. Yeah. When I read that thing talking about if God should send on each man the nation of the judgments which they deserve, you know, they'd be drinking a big wine of astonishment. Also reminds me of Psalm 103 when it's like he does not treat us as our sins deserve. Right. So we greatly appreciate that, Lord God, that you don't treat us as our sins deserve, uh, at least in their entirety. Right. Because we'd all be squished like a little ant, squished like an ant. Uh, verse seven. Uh, if we see hard things, let us remember that our that's right. Our sins call for them. That's right. Number eight. Number eight. If we have been in affliction, the prosperity begins to return. Uh, let us not forget our chastisements, but remember them for our own good and for God's glory. Verses one through three. Such an exercise promotes both humility and hope. Got to agree with that. Going to have to agree with that. It also cites Lamentations, uh, chapter 3, verse 19, 20, and 21. Um, uh, if we have been in affliction and prosperity begins to return, let's not forget our chastisements, but remember them for our own good. Like if the Lord corrects you, if the Lord corrects you in your hard time, when times get better, don't forget that, right? Don't forget how he corrected you. Don't forget how he tuned you up, right? Stay humble. Such an uh, exercise promotes both humility and hope. Amen. Number nine, those who fear God have sources of encouragement uh, that the world knows not of. Uh, they have a banner for which they would die. Under it, they can never perish. There you go. So that's the good news, right? It says those who fear God have sources of encouragement that the world knows not of. Right? God can hold us up. Uh, God can actually give us joy in our suffering. Uh, God can persevere us. And the, the how he does that, the joy he gives us or the peace of heart and peace of mind that he gives us, the world can't fully understand and possibly not understand at all. They can't understand it at all. But God gives us as many sources of encouragement and hope. Amen. And we appreciate that. We live for that. We thank God so much for that. Number 10, if the banner of God's truth and covenant are so glorious in their effects, on those who know and love the gospel. Why should it not be displayed in every valley and on every mountaintop and sinners of every nation and tongue under heaven be led to embrace Jesus Christ and his salvation? That's interesting. I'm going to read it again. If the banner of God's truth and covenant are so glorious in their effects on those who know and love the gospel, why should it not be displayed in every valley and on every mountaintop and sinners of every nation and tongue under heaven be led to embrace Jesus Christ and his salvation. He's saying there, it's like, look, you know, a lot of us who've gone through really horrible things, really, really hard things, and God has sustained us in the past. And for some of us, God is sustaining us currently. And if, I mean, especially, you know, when you see like really godly parents lose a child, it's absolutely brutal, but it's like, they have this calmness and this peace in their heart that God's in control and that their child is in heaven, you know, and that's for some reason God saw fit. And that gives us peace. That gives a peace to us, a peace that the world knows not. Uh, they do not know this peace that God gives. And this peace that God gives is better than millions of dollars. Right. I would not trade the peace of God for millions of dollars. It could be I would not train the tra trade the peace of God for 500 million. You would think 500 million is a lot of money. And to even and we're talking 500 million that the government doesn't tax. Right. So you get straight 500 million straight to your account. I wouldn't do it. I would not give that away or take that in giving away the peace of God. Nope. Nope. The peace that God has and offers and gives us is better than any type of riches on this side of eternity by leaps and bounds. I mean, we could even get into the billions. Like, would I want a billion dollars in exchange for the peace of God? Can't do it. Can't do it. And just at, hopefully you feel the same way. 
hopefully you feel the same way. You know, you're like, I've experienced the peace of God. I've experienced God sustaining me, holding me up. And that that feeling and that confidence and peace and joy that God gives. Um, yeah, there you go. Faye, I agree with you 100 percent. She said, I wouldn't trade God's peace for anything in this world. I agree. I agree. The peace of God, it's almost, I mean, we can, we can try to explain to lost people. We can try to explain to unsaved people, you know, but it's like, it's kind of like, I remember the Washington Post newspaper when I was a little kid. They're like, if you don't get it, you don't get it. I think that was the Washington Post. I could be wrong, but it was like, if you don't get it, you don't get it. It means a lot of things, but definitely when it's talking about the peace of God, if you never experience it, you really don't want, you know, you just can't understand it. So, but it only comes through what bowing to Christ, you know, surrender yourself to Christ and being born again. Then you can experience that peace of God, which surpasses all understanding. Amen to that. So that's a cool note. You know, this guy's writing this 1800, some 18, you know, 80s or something. If the banner of God's truth and covenant are so glorious in their effects on those who know the love of, of the love, I'm sorry. Those who know and love the gospel, why should it not be displayed in every valley also, right? And on every mountaintop and sinners of every nation and tongue under heaven be led to embrace Jesus Christ and his salvation. So, you know, we let people know, we witness, they're like, look, the peace of God, the peace of God, the peace of God. You know, sometimes churches and they talk about, hey, you know, God wants to bless you with all this uh Material stuff, materialism, money and houses and raises and cars and trucks and boats and all this stuff, blah, blah, blah. But I'd rather grow in character and faith. I'd rather grow in character and faith. So I do not I don't give two cares. Um, you put you put that stuff up against the peace of God, the salvation of God, the joy of God. I would be absolutely happy to live in extreme poverty, extreme poverty. For the rest of my life, if I had to for the peace of God, no problem. I'd be like, no problem. Where do I sign? You know, all right. Number 11. It, uh, this, these are some study notes on Psalm 60. OK. It says, it is perfectly safe for the righteous always to fight under the banner of truth. There you go. That's my publishing company that I love. Banner of Truth Publishing Company right there. Look at that. Psalm 60, um, probably verse 4. Because the truth is always for them and not for their enemies. Uh, it's good to be on the side of truth. You know, sometimes we got to watch out. Sometimes we think we're on the side of truth. Sometimes we can get deceived, even believers, even the elect. We got to do everything we can not to be deceived and have a right understanding of scripture, have a right understanding of truth. We love that banner of truth. There you go. Yeah, my, my favorite website, banner of truth.org, www.banner of truth.org. Right to here. So when I die, someone looks at this book, they can look at www.banner of truth.org. Amen. Maybe we'll see it. All right. Verse 12. Though the world thinks uh, not so, yet it is abundantly clear that those who fear God are his beloved ones. That's right. Right. Piece of cake. Easy peasy. It's as obvious as uh, a white grasshopper, albino grasshopper in the grass. Right. I saw an albino grasshopper the other day. I picked him up and moved him. Didn't want to chop him up. Um just a beautiful thing, but he stood out, right? Though the world thinks not so, uh, yet it is abundantly clear that those who fear God are his beloved ones. There you go. If you fear God, honor God, respect God, obey God, you are his beloved ones. Uh, number 13 says, um, in none of our distresses is it safe or wise or right for us to call in and rely on power, not omnipotent. Um, omnipotent. God's right hand is full of strength. There you go. It's like when you're in distress, it's not uh, in none of our distresses. Is it safe or wise or right for us to call in and rely on power, not omnipotent? So it's like when you're in a jam, 
you know, it's we're, we're tempted to call people for help more so than call on God for help. And uh, so, you know, if we get in a bind and we're like, oh, let me call this friend. They can help me out. Let's let's try to get more to let me pray about this and see what God wants, because he is omnipotent means all powerful. So it's like we no matter what type of bog we're in, no matter what type of uh, trouble we're in. You know, God is all powerful. Go to God. Right. In our distresses, it's uh, in none of our distresses. Is it safe or wise or right for us to call in and rely on on power, not omnipotent? Right. It's amazing. Call on God. God's right hand is full of strength. Yes, it is. I mentioned that in this morning's reading. Right. God's right hand, you know. God's right hand, especially his right hand of judgment. I mean, you lo love his right hand of power to assist you. Amen. But his right hand of judgment for the uh, unsaved and the wicked is like a Mike Tyson punch. I just think of Mike Tyson in the 80s when he was just knocking fools out. And like all, everything was under a minute. Everything was in the first round. It's like it was impressive when Mike Tyson was like 19, 20, 21. I was crazy. But uh, but even that pales in comparison to the the awesomeness and the mighty power of God. Sure. Number 14, because God is holy. Let me just write Mike Tyson right there. Interesting individual. Come a long way. Definitely has come a long way in his life. It's uh, interesting to listen to him now. Number 14, because God is holy, he cannot speak a word that is not true. I agree. And because he is holy, he will fulfill all he has promised and all he has threatened. Whew, yeah. Sorry about that. Sorry about that. Didn't mean to make you yawn. Number 15, uh, whatever success and advantage a Christian may gain, yet his great reliance for final victory is not on what he sees or feels or does, but on God's blessed word. God has spoken, dot, dot, dot. I will rejoice. So that's pretty cool. Let me uh, break the pen out for that one. Oh, that's the pencil, sorry. So whatever success and advantage a Christian may gain, yet his great reliance for victory is not on what he sees or feels or does, but on God's blessed word. That's right. The word of God. We march forward with the word of God. God has spoken. I will rejoice. Number 16, the conquest of surrounding hostile nations to David's government. The conquest of sur surrounding hostile nations to David's government was a type of the blessed reign of Messiah's Messiah's uh, who shall yet be Lord of every land and nation to the glory of God, the father, verse six through eight. He must rule over all the earth for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Amen. Cheers to that. That's right. I like that. It's all about the word of God, the word of God, the centrality of the word. Um, your five solas, one is uh, sola scriptura, your five onlys, right? Sola scriptura. We want to be Bible centered, we want to be Christ centered and uh, scripture centered, amen. Number 16, uh, this is all study notes of chapter 60 in uh, the Psalms, Psalm 60. Number 16, the conquest, uh, oh, I read that one. The conquest of surrounding hostile nations to God's government was a type of the blessed reign of the Messiah. Who shall yet be the Lord over every land and nation to the glory of God the Father? He must rule over all the earth, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. All right, got it. Number 17, the conquest and subjugation. All right, here we go. This is that portion where Psalm 60 starts. I'm sorry, Psalm 108. We'll put that right here, Psalm 108. It says the conquest and subjugation of Moab, Edom, Philistia by David, acting under a special direction of God, who would punish those nations for their sins, can never warrant wars of conquest and of cruelty waged by men, uh, who have no such revelation from heaven. By the gospel, all tyranny and cruelty are forbidden. Uh, let invading conquerors remember that. Interesting. Let me read that again. Uh, the conquest and subjugation of Moab, Edom, and Philistia by David, acting under a special direction of God, 
who would punish those nations for their sins can never warrant wars of conquest and of cruelty waged by men who have no such revelation from heaven. Uh, by the gospel, all tyranny and cruelty are forbidden. Let invading conquerors remember that. So he's just like, you know, basically he's like, try to live at peace with everybody. If you're a king and you have a kingdom, you have a king and you have an army and you're just taking out people for whatever reason, he said, it's, you don't have the word of God on that. You don't have revelation from heaven. And uh, it's it, what you're doing is forbidden. By the gospel, all tyranny and cruelty are forbidden. Let invading conquerors remember that. Amen. And he might have been speaking about the north because this bro's from the south. Because the north invaded the south, as you guys know. Um, and did a lot of nasty stuff. Number 18, it is not conclusive evidence that we are not called to undertake a given work or perform a certain duty because it is very difficult or even impossible for us to succeed without special help from God. If God calls David to take Petra, he shall take Petra. I'll read again. Number 18, it is not conclusive obedience that we are not called to undertake a given work or perform a certain duty because it is very difficult or even impossible for us to succeed without the special help from God. Verse 9 and 10, if God calls David to take Petra, he shall take Petra. Number 19, God undertaking for us, we can do anything. Verse 10, only let us look to him alone. God undertaking for us. God undertaking for us, we can do anything. Only let us look to him alone. Amen. Number 20. Uh, whatever our trouble may be, let us look to God for help. When we think we can carry our own burden, it is always too heavy for us. Amen. Amen to that. Ain't that right, y'all? That is correct. Whatever trouble may be, uh, let us look to God for help when we think we can carry our own burden. It is always too heavy for us. Look at 21. Or you don't have 21. 21 says, never trust in man. His help is vain. Cursed is he that trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm. This is a universal sin. That's right. Trust in God and God alone. We appreciate the help of man, but ultimately God is the one. He's pulling all strings. You can have a whole bunch of people and it, it don't. you can still lose. So it says, never trust in man. Help, his help is vain. Cursed is he that trusteth in man and maketh his flesh his arm. This is a universal sin. Yes, it is. All right, we're almost done. We got 22, 23, 24, 25, 26. We're almost done. Last little paragraph. All right. Can't carry it all alone. There you go, right, Kim? That's right, Kim. Amen, sister. So it says, uh, 22, let us ex expect an answer to our supplications. Let us an expect an answer to our supplications. Henry, David prays in hope. His prayer is, give us help from trouble, verse 11. Even in the day of their triumph, they see themselves in trouble because still in war, which is troublesome even to the prevailing side. I agree. I agree. All right. This is uh, these are study notes on Psalm 60. Study notes on Psalm 60. Uh, it says, however feeble we may be in numbers, in strength, in resources, yet through God we can do valiantly. That's right. That's right. Let me write that down. However feeble we may be in numbers. Right. No matter how small your church is. Right. No matter how small your group is and strength and resources. Yet through God, we can do valiantly. Right. God can accomplish anything through any number of people. Amen. And amen. All right, we only got three more left. Number 24. It says Jehovah treads down many and mighty as easily as few and feeble foes. Jehovah treads down many and mighty as easily as few as few and feeble foes. That's right. God, uh, God can wreck and he can, it, it don't matter the size of the army. Then, uh, doesn't matter the size of the demon. It don't matter the size of the horde of demons. It doesn't matter the size of, uh, the wicked country or wicked nation. Uh, he can defeat them as though they were few and plenty. 
are few and weak. <laughs> few and weak. Feeble. Feeble is the word they use. So that's a, that's a cool one. We like 24. Right? Jehovah treads down many and mighty uh, as easily as few and feeble foes. All right, number 25 says, Let us doubly careful that we do not at any time ascribe to creatures the honor due to God alone. That's right. Let us be doubly careful that we do not at any time ascribe to creatures the honor due to God alone. That's right. And then uh, this guy, Mr. Dixon, Mr. Dixon says, quote, Praise of the valor and gallantry of victorious soldiers must not separate betwixt God and the victor. But whatsoever God doth in us or by us must be no less wholly ascribed unto God than if he had done all the work without us. For both the valor of the instrument and the victory are the works of the Lord. Agreed. So basically, this is like one of those things where it's like, look, if you basically I got no problem saying this. If I do anything good, it's of the Lord. If I do anything bad, it's of me. I got no problem playing that game. I got no problem explaining things like that. If I do anything good, it's the Lord Jesus Christ. OK, if I do anything noble, anything noteworthy, anything you know special, it's of the Lord. God did that. God did that through me. Right. To God be the glory. Right. If I do anything, dumb, if I sin, that's me. If I do anything dumb, that's me. Stupid, that's me. Anything careless, that's me. I take all those. Got no problem taking those. I hate those. I hate those for sure. I want to be sharp. I want to be on point. I want to, I want to reflect the goodness of God. I want to reflect the kindness and character of Jesus, you know. But, you know, if anything good is accomplished, to him get to be the glory. To him get the praise. Okay. So it's cool. That's basically what he said here. I'll read it. This is 1880 language. So it was 1880, 140 years ago. It says, let us be doubly careful that we do not at any time ascribe to creatures the honor due to God alone. Right. So don't don't praise creatures that for what really God deserves. Right. Don't get make sure he gets his praise. Make sure God gets his praise. You know, it's OK to encourage someone and say, hey, you know, I appreciate you doing this. I appreciate you did a good job, this and that, you know, but ultimately it's like to God be the glory. And, you know, you could, hey, I appreciate what the Lord said through you today. I appreciate what the, what the Lord's doing through you. Boom, 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 boom on anybody, on anything, on anybody. Amen. So that's a good study note. It says uh, Mr. Dixon says, quote, praise. A quote, praise of the valor and gallantry of victorious soldiers must not separate betwixt God and the victor, but whatsoever God doth in us or by us must be no less wholly ascribed unto God than if he had done all the work without us, for both the valor of the instrument and the victory are the works of the Lord. I agree 100 percent. And then lastly, here's the last study. This last study note is Mr. Th uh, Tholuck, Tholuck, Tholuck. A T H O L U C K, like Tho Luck, Tho Luck, Tho Luck, Tho Luck, Tho Luck. Mr. Tho Luck said, quote, The course of life alternates between the heights and depths, totally. Uh, such was the experience of David, as here recorded. Let us not hope to cross the sea of life without storms. There you go. It's like, look. Life's going to be hard. There's going to be good times. There's going to be bad times. There may be more bad times than good times, but, you know, you just got to roll with the punches. Just like I was talking to a neighbor down the street, you know, we're talking about somebody, you know, this kid, his dad passed, right, you know, in our church, Chance, our 14-year-old Chance, you know, uh, his dad passed, and, you know, and we're praying for Chance. And actually, we should put Chance, we'll put Chance on the everyday prayer list uh, for our group, too. Just because, uh, you know, his dad died and it's hard on him. Right. And his mom, his mom was not around. It was his dad who was raising him, you know. So we pray for Chance um, and his walk. But we like, you know, like the thing was we were trying to say was. Uh, there we go. It's like hey, life's hard. Life is hard. We lose loved ones. You know, we lose loved ones and we have hard times. Friends betray us. People betray us. Uh, people hurt us. Uh, our work can hurt us. Our neighbors can hurt us. You know, on and on. A bunch of people can hurt us. Life is hard. But we are to rejoice and do the best we 
push through. Worship God as you go through your suffering. So Mr. Tholuck says, the course of life alternates between the heights and depths, right? we got highs and we got lows, right? Such was the experience of David, King David, as he recorded. Let us not hope to cross the sea of life without storms, right? Uh, if you're going to cross the sea of life, chances are you're going to come across some big waves. You're going to come across some lightning storms. Uh, you're going to come across some, some scary stuff. So that's on 26. So that's the end of the study notes of Psalm 60. Okay. I'm going to stick a little three by five card right there. Uh, that's real good. Now the study notes on Psalm 57. Psalm 57. Uh, so Psalm 57, uh, be merciful unto me, O God, be merciful unto me, for my soul trusteth in thee. Yea, in the shadow of thy wings, I will make my refuge until these calamities be overpassed. I will cry unto God most high, unto God that performeth all things for me. He shall send from heaven and save me from the reproach of him that would swallow me up. God shall send forth his mercy and his strength. My soul is among lions, and I lie even among them that are set on fire, even the sons of men, whose teeth are spears and arrows, and their tongue a sharp sword. Verse 5, Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. So even though he's going through it, right, you got this burning over here. You got lions over here. Uh, you got the sons of men whose teeth are like spears and arrows, right? They're saying a whole bunch of ratchet stuff. Even though, he says, but what? Let thy glory be above all the earth. They have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They have digged a pit before me. Into the midst thereof they, they are fallen themselves, right? My heart is fixed, O God. My heart is fixed. I will sing and give praise. So that's right. You, you want your heart fixed. You want to be set to give God praise no matter what you go through, right? So when the crap hits the fan, uh, you know, no matter no matter how hard it is, your heart is fixed to what? Worship God. Hey, Faye, Faye says, who take care of Chance now that daddy's gone? Uh, his uncle, his uncle and his aunt. His grandpa lives next door, but it's Uncle, uh, uncle Benji and Aunt Rachel. All right, verse 8. Awake up, my glory, awake, psaltery and harp. I myself will awake early. I will praise thee, O Lord, among the people. I will sing unto thee among the nations, for thy mercy is great unto the heavens and thy truth unto the clouds. Be thou exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let thy glory be above all the earth. So that's a cool psalm, Psalm 57, right? Got some hard times, hard times, hard times. But what do he say? <sighs> glory be to God. 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 Let me read some of study notes on that. Uh, I think one of my phones is about to die in like maybe 10 minutes. So I'll just read a little, uh, some of these doctrinal and practical remarks uh, from uh, Psalm 57. All right. Psalm 57. All right. Number one, it says pious men, right? Or godly men. That's the word they use in the old, you know, old days. Pious men. Godly men have often found some set words in prayer very suitable to themselves. David's mind, if we understand the title, often led him to cry, destroy me not. So that's good. So he said to God, destroy me not, destroy me not, right? Pious men have often found some set words in prayer very suitable to themselves. David's mind, uh, if we understand the title, often led him to cry, destroy me not. Amen to that, right? So you say, Lord, psh, don't wipe me off the planet Earth. You know, Lord, uh, you know, help me to remember I say I say a lot of prayers in the morning. But some of those prayers are what? Lord, don't let me say anything stupid today. Don't let me do anything stupid today. Help me to do a good job at, uh, you know, respecting you and respecting people, treating people right and walking in my faith right. OK, number two, two is a big one. Study note number two says, while life lasts, we shall never be done crying for mercy. I agree, bro. I'm just going to go ahead and get break the blue out for that. What is this white? I won't even be able to see this white. Let me see what that does. Pious. Yeah, that must be for like different colored paper. <laughs> different colored paper. All right. Uh, it says, while life lasts, we shall never be done crying for mercy. Verse one, whether it be famine or pestilence or war. So pestilence and famine. Uh, pestilence could be coronavirus, right? Whether it be coronavirus or war or famine. 
whether it be foes without or fears within, whether it be at sea or on land, whether it be in sickness or health, in life or in death, our great need is mercy. That's right. So mercy is God treating us better than we deserve, uh, not treating us as we truly deserve, not giving us the bad that we do deserve, right? Asking for mercy. We should always be asking for God's mercy. Amen. Well said. Yea, we shall need it at the day of judgment. 2 Timothy 1, 18. Nothing but mercy can protect us from human malice or diabolical rage. Uh, from personal vindictiveness or legal injustice, from sin and life, from despair and death, or from hell and eternity. When man hates us, let us seek the love of God. When man reproaches us, let us seek the honor that comes from God only. When man is cruel, let us seek God's loving kindness, a good daily prayer, a good motto for every, every tempted, troubled soul would be Oh, that's a that's a Hebrew word. Al Tasheth. It's probably have mercy. Have mercy. <laughs> I don't know Hebrew, sorry. So that's a good one. That's a very good one. That is a good one. So it's like always, Lord, have mercy on me, have mercy on me, have mercy on me. Can't go wrong. Like, Lord, oh God, have mercy. And help me to do better. Help me to do well. Help me to do great. Help me to represent you well in the kingdom. Amen. Number three, the scriptures are harmonious in declaring the relations of believers to God to be of the most precious and substantial nature. His first approach, he first approaches us and proposes his covenant by the grace of his spirit. We trust in him, make him our refuge and thus set to our seal that he is true. And in so doing, he comes to be on our side. Henceforth, we may plead his gracious engagement uh, with the utmost freedom and earnestness. Verse one, quote, where faith in trouble fleeth unto God, it cannot but speed. Quote. Jeremiah 14, 21. All right. Number four, how condescending is God to compare himself to a foul tender of her young? Verse one, Calvin, John Calvin says, quote, there are seasons when we are permitted to enjoy the calm sunshine of sunshine of prosperity. But there is not a day of our lives in which we may not suddenly be overtaken by storms of affliction. And it is necessary we should be persuaded that God will cover us with his wings. Amen to that. Amen. That's beautiful. Number five, there is no getting on without trust confidence in God. Verse one, the want of it annihilates our comforts. That's right, man. The trust of God, like we read in the last chapter, we just said, man, the peace of God, trusting in God. I would not want to trade my faith and trust in God for $500 billion. If someone's like, I will put $500 billion in your account, but you won't have, won't be able to have faith and trust in God, nor the peace of God. I'd be like, take a hike. Sorry, take a hike. Can't do it. I surely don't want a million or five million or 50 million or 100 million or a thousand billion in exchange for peace with God, reconciliation with God, faith in God, trust in God. No, thank you. All right. That's right. Not even for a billion. Number six, every generation has its calamities. Uh, verse one, uh, of these, none are harder to be born than those which come to us through the wickedness of man. God himself is our only sure refuge. There you go, right? So there's calamities, right? Every generation has its calamities. Of these, none are harder to be born than those which come to us through the wickedness of men. So, yeah, it's like, you know, there's hard times. Hard times come. Right. You can uh, drop a lawnmower blade on your toenail. Right. And you're going to lose your toenail. Going to hurt like a dickens. You almost makes you cry. Right. It can make a grown man cry. Uh, but that's not as bad as being sinned against by wicked men. The wickedness of man and being sinned and, and heart and hurt by them is even worse. And it will come because man is wicked. But we pray that everyone gets saved. What is this you are reading? So much truth. Oh, this is. Uh, uh, this is a commentary on Psalms by William S. Plumer. 
William S. Plumer. Plumer is P-L-U-M-E-R. He's a real cool bro. He's got like a really nice, uh, he has an excellent uh, beard. His beard game is a beast. Uh, it's probably not in here, but uh, Psalms, a critical and expository commentary with doctrinal and practical remarks by Dr. William S. Plumer. This is a Banner of Truth book, right? www.banneroftruth.org. Uh, you can find this commentary there. William S. Plumer. He's from like the 1860s, uh, 1880s. Uh, he was a Presbyterian bro, but amazing notes. He has amazing notes on the Psalms. So, all right. Number six. Uh, every generation has its calamities. That's oh, right. We just did that one, right? Uh, of these, none are harder to be born than those which come to us through the wickedness of man. God himself is our only sure refuge. Amen. Got to throw, throw an a amen down on paper for that. Amen. God is good. Number seven, if we would have our prayers answered, they must not be dull. Uh, we must. Looks like the printer didn't print it right. I don't know. It says we must err unto God. No, I can't be right. Cry unto God. Let me fix that. Looks like the printer printed it. Let's go ahead and say cry. We must cry unto God, verse 2. If anything is worth asking for, it is worth asking for in good earnest. That's good, right? Yeah, if you're going to pray for something, pray with some earnestness. Pray with some sincerity. Uh, pray with a little power on it, right? Come before the Lord boldly. Say, Lord, uh, save my, save this young man, right? Uh, save the soul of this young man. Help, the, help, help my buddy grow in his faith. Help my sister grow in her faith, right? Help my mother grow in her faith. Oh, God, save our president. God, save our cabinet. Save our Senate. Save our House of Representatives. May they all be born again. May they all be transformed and grow in sound doctrine. Amen and amen. Uh, if yeah, if we would yeah, if any, if we would have our prayers answered, they must not be dull. We must cry unto God. Verse two: If anything is worth asking for, it is worth asking for in good earnest. Quote: Elias prayed earnestly. Right? Elias prayed earnestly. That's in James. Without some measure of earnestness, prayer is solemn, solemn mockery, and that's something. So there you go. This is a good one. This is a good one. So we in Psalm uh, fifty-seven. And it says, look, if we would have our prayers answered, they must not be dull, right? So don't come at God with some weak sauce. It says, we must cry unto God. Verse 2 of Psalm 57. We must cry unto God. If anything is worth asking for, it is worth asking for in good earnest, right? Uh, Elias prayed earnestly. Without some measure of earnestness, prayer is solemn mockery. So if you come with prayer and you just you just pray in like you bored or something like that, it's actually mockery to God. You should come praying with passion and conviction uh, and your emotions and your mind uh, and your soul and your spirit uh, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Uh, verse eight or not verse eight, but study note on eight. It says our past experience of God's mercies should encourage us to come to him with boldness. All right. If he has performed all things for us hitherto, let us not doubt his mercy at any time hereafter. He changes not but fulfills his engagements. Amen to that, right? Our past experiences of God's mercy should encourage us to come to him with boldness, right? Don't come with weak sauce. Come with boldness. Come with passion. Come with conviction, earnestness. Don't come soft and timid and weak. Uh, if he has performed all things for us hitherto, let us not doubt his mercy at any time hereafter. He changes not, but fulfills his engagements. Number nine is a quote from Matthew Henry. He quotes Matthew Henry and says, In everything that befalls us, everything that befalls us, we ought to see and own the hand of God. Okay, In everything that befalls us, we ought to see and own the hand of God. Whatever is done is of his performing. In it, his counsel is accomplished and the scripture is fulfilled. This is a great one. This is a great one. That's right. All right, Henry, in everything that befalls us, we ought to see and own the hand of. All right, let me write down something real quick. God. Yeah. 
All right. All right, cool. My, so I've been on for an hour. I'm going to knock off. Uh, you can only record for an hour on Instagram. So we'll go ahead and that. See you, Instagram. Thanks for tuning in, y'all. There we go. There we go. Excellent. Okay, good, good, good. Um, let's see. Number 10, this is Psalm on Psalm 57. This is study note number 10. It says, like his attributes, let me switch over to pen. Like his attributes, God's resources are infinite. Actually, I'm going to start that Instagram right back up because you never know who's going to come on there. Boom, boom, boom. There we go. Keep that, keep that Instagram. You know, it's just like fishing, just like fishing. All right, number 10. Uh, like his attributes, God's resources are infinite. Uh, he has many on earth of which we wot not, W-O-T, wot not. Uh, he has many on earth. Like his attributes, God's resources are infinite. Infinite. Uh, he has many on earth of which we want not. Like, okay. It's like we, we got them all. And he has all heaven besides. And if heaven and earth were all gone, he has himself. It is always safe to expect him to save by raising up instruments and messengers here below or by sending them from heaven. Uh, Verse three, Uh, this guy, Mr. Dixon says in ordinary means, uh, if ordinary means fail, faith assureth itself of God's working wonders for perfecting his promises. So what it is, is like God is always working, trusting in God, calling for mercy he'll provide, right? Uh, All his attributes are available to his children, right? His attributes uh, and his help that comes from those attributes. Uh, God's resources are infinite, okay? He has many on earth of which, uh, you know, we have access to. And he has all heaven besides. And if heaven and earth were all gone, he has himself. Uh, it is always safe to expect him to save by raising up instruments and messengers here below, right? Sometimes God saves us through raising up a friend, a new friend, or raising up a word, or raising up a Bible study or something like that. Something God will help us. And if it's not by here below, he'll send angels from heaven. He'll send angels from heaven to help us. And that's good news. So if, it, if ordinary means fail, like the things of this earth, then Faith assureth itself of God's working wonders for perfecting his promises. A lot of times God will send his angels to help us. All right, the number 11 study note on Psalm uh, 57. It says, it is no new thing for good men to have barbarous foes. Who would if they could swallow them up, right? All right, so uh, it is no new thing. So good men, no matter what, you live in a faith, uh, we're going to have crazy foes. We're going to have crazy foes. And if they could, if they had the chance, they would try to swallow us up. But we got God. But God, right? His mercy, his mercy, his hand, his omnipotence, right? His power. Come praying boldly for the power of God to sustain us when wicked people come uh, come against us or come against our loved ones. That's right. All right. Number 12 is a big one. This number 12 is a big one. This is on Psalm 57. No reasonable man can doubt the awful depravity of the wicked. That's true. The depravity of man is a doctrine that's clear as day. Uh, Could inspiration have used more decided or forcible language than it has? It says they are fierce, cruel, savage as lions, that they are violent, blind, and heedless of all claims for tenderness as fire itself. That they that the very powers which God has given them for nourishing themselves, their teeth are used to devour their neighbors, even their best friends, and that their tongue, man's glory, has become not an instrument of blessing God and man, but a heart, a sharp sword to make men bleed, to fill them with pain and to kill them. Verse four. Such tormentors are quite like their father, the devil. His works. Uh, they are constantly doing uh, the destructive power of evil speaking alone is frightful. Uh, that's uh, excellent. Excellent on total depravity. Right. Because it talks about that in that, that chapter we just read. Right. When it says. Uh, 
It says, my soul is among lions, right? And I lie even among them that are set on fire. Okay. Here we go. This phone's almost, battery's almost out. Even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows and their tongues a sharp sword. Yeah. So it's just the depravity of man, verse 4. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. And he, God will save me from the reproach of him that would swallow me up, right? There's some people that would rather just swallow us up. Wicked, wicked people. That's right. All right, so, uh, yeah, that's an excellent one. And uh, the wicked. All right. I'll read that one more time. No reasonable man can doubt the awful depravity of the wicked. That's right. Total depravity. Uh, could inspiration have used more decided or forceful language than it has? It says they are fierce, cruel, savage lions, that they are violent, blind, and heedless of all claims for tenderness as fire itself. Uh, that the very powers which God has given them for nourishing themselves, their teeth, are used to devour their neighbors, even their best friends. And that their tongue, man's glory, has become not an instrument of blessing, uh, blessing God and man, but a sharp sword to make men bleed. Look, when I read that, it says, and their tongue, man's glory, has become not an instrument of blessing God and man. We are to, with our tongue, bless God and man. That's why, like, at the Hope Center, it's weird. Like, look, I'm a shepherd. I'm a pastor. Like, my job is to shepherd and pastor and disciple. But, like, you don't see a whole lot of compliments there for whatever reason. We got a cool crew, decently good people, but people don't encourage people. People don't, you know, I'm so like I go out of my way to say, you know, Jack, you're doing a great job with that produce. You're slinging, you're making them bag, them produce bags like the best of them. Right. So we encourage people that way. Uh, you know, Bubba DiStefano on the boxes. Bubba, you're making some excellent boxes. Your boxes are glorious. OK, uh, you know, encourage people, encourage people. Uh, you have a tongue. Use it for edification. As a biblical term to build up one another, to edify. Okay. Uh, but a sharp, but, but like it says, that their tongue, man's glory, has become not an instrument of blessing God and men, but a sharp sword to make men bleed, to fill them with pain, and to kill them. That's right. Such tormentors are quite like their father, the devil. His works they are constantly doing. Uh, compare Micah 3 5, Galatians 5 15. Uh, Habakkuk 1 13 Psalm uh, 52 verse 4 the destructive power of evil speaking alone is frightful all right look I'm gonna have to shut down one of my phones is about hey good morning mama good morning mama just hopped on here did some reading uh, I'm gonna come back on we'll charge my phones I'll be back on in a little while so appreciate y'all let me pray for you guys dear Lord bless everybody on the call this morning uh, this late morning thank you get some Psalm 60 and some Psalm 57 and some study notes on there which is really the uh, you combine those two to give you Psalm 108 uh, which we'll be studying tonight lift up church tonight we got church tonight we got supper at 545 central time 545 jambalaya and 615 we have our prayer meeting and Bible study so we're looking forward to that so thank you Lord for all of your help Thank you, God, for saving us, and thanks for letting us have fellowship today. In Christ's name, amen. All right. All right, Mama, good to have you on. Kim, thanks for being on here. Uh, Jessica Remsen, thanks for hopping on. Good to have you. Faye Carney, a pleasure having you. Thank you for, for your comments and being on here and your prayers. That's right. She said, I, I wouldn't trade God's peace for anything in this world. I agree with you, Faye. That's what I'll be saying. Sandy Wilson O'Shea, good to have you on. Uh, pleasure. And... Um, Sherry McNeil, God bless you and your son. That's right. Uh, Sherry McNeil's son. I want to put, got to write that down. Sherry McNeil's son. Okay, good, good. Good to have you all on, man. Praise the Lord. And Sharon, uh, let's see, uh, Maria Elder was on. God bless you, cousin. And Victoria Bro uh, Broadfoot, God bless you. Uh, good to have you guys on in Christ's name. Catch y'all later. Catch y'all later. All right, so we got that one. We got this one. And uh, 
All right. Let's see. What's up, guys? Just catch you later. On and do a little reading real quick. Uh, I just want to hop on through this reading right quick. It's on Psalm 108. It's uh, William S. Plumer. William S. Plumer. Banner Truth Commentary. Um, All right. YouTube, God bless you.